Thank you. So I thought it was interesting to talk about this topic, especially now that we have so much technology. Uh, you cannot imagine what happened 20 years ago with the technology that we have and how much we had to rush to get everything working uh, to observe this collision. We knew about the, the comet about a year before the collision, uh, so we had to apply for a, a grant that we ran just a few months before the collision. So I'll mention a few names of people who are still uh, alive and here. Uh, <laughs> participate. <laughs> uh, the other interesting aspect is that uh, with the new technology doing the network of observation to observe these kind of things, that would be amazing because not even with all the resources that we have at that time, we were able to get something uh, similar to what uh, is available right now. So I'll go to that. Uh, after I finish, uh, Tom is going to probably show a couple of slides with other observations that were made. I'm going to restrict my presentation to uh, observations made by our group and a few others that were connected with our group. So here you can see uh, the effect of the collision. So I believe that was fragment G or so, one of the biggest fragments in the collision. Uh, that was a very interesting thing. We were actually able to see uh, using a telescope, charged to, to the telescope to the right observatory, we were able to see some of these things a few minutes after they, they happened. All right, so let's go to the next one here. Uh, nice picture here. You can see um, the comet going to Jupiter. That's it. Uh, composite image because Jupiter was too bright with respect to the color, but there you can see Jupiter. And uh, here you can see Io and the shadow uh, of Io on uh, Jupiter. All right, so uh, let me step here so I can read a little bit more. So before the condition of the comet, there were several predictions. Uh, many groups uh, actually wrote a few papers trying to uh, predict what was going to happen there. Uh, some of the predictions had to do with the effect of the dust uh, in the uh, Jovian magnetosphere. So the comets were coming there with gas and dust, and that's going to populate the, mag the, the magnetosphere, especially the inner part of the magnetosphere, and that may have an effect in all the electrons going around, which had to do with the decametric emission and the synchrotron emission. So there were a few papers here that tried to do that. Uh, there were other papers that addressed the electrodynamical effects of the, uh, if the fragment of the comet going through the magnetosphere. Something similar to what happened in the case of Jupiter. We had a magnetic field which is sweeping past uh, iron, and in that case, it will induce a voltage difference between iron, and that pretty much uh, triggers the alpha waves and the, the electrons going up and down. And so, something similar may happen in the case of the, the fragments also. If you have enough gas, uh, and the gas will be ionized in time. So, some of those uh, uh, predictions are, are there. But there were other predictions also uh, in a completely different topic, and let me show you one, one of them here. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was published by Sun uh, regarding the effect of the collision of the comet here. And, uh, very interesting, I had to participate in a TV program in Miami and deal with a few people who were predicting all kinds of effects there for the direction <laughs> of that thing. So after the collision, uh, there were a few effects also. <laughs> 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 that was the proof that uh, the alien actually said that they were uh, uh, trying to help, get help from the rest of them. So we thought, wow, we had to, to do something regarding that. So, uh, here we are trying to send <laughs> Use the bigger way, with the bigger way we should get there. 
provide some kind of help. We never hear from them, so we are not hear from them. <laughs> All right, let's consider. These are some of the papers that were published before the collision. You can see many here. We didn't publish anything there. Uh, we have a lot of conversation among all the group and some other group to what we should expect there and we pay attention to some of these things. But you can see that there were several papers published here regarding the, the collision of the comet. Uh, this is going to be available in case you want to go and take a look to some of the papers. I'm not going to uh, detail some of these things, but here regarding the electrodynamical interaction or the effect of the uh, the dust and the gas in the emission. And also, even before that, some precursors uh, regarding the emission. This is a group from um, Goddard Space Flight Center. And also, uh, at least there was one, I'm not sure if uh, more than that, uh, published by Inke the Pater. She uh, was predicting something regarding the synchrotron emission, not the decametric emission. Actually, she thought that the decametric emission will shut down. There was a quench of the emission uh, because of the dust there. We'll see what happened after that. Okay. So, uh, here is part of the story. The PI for uh, the project was uh, Dr. Tom Hart, who passed away about four years ago, uh, I was, everybody else was trying to help with this thing. So he applied for a grant to NASA, he got the grant. Unfortunately, the grant, I think, came in February or March, so we had to rush and buy equipment, antennas, and all kinds of things. Uh, so I'll probably detail some of the people involved in that. Uh, so we uh, were able to set up two stations, one of them was our observatory, which we had to improve by building more antennas that were able to detect the polarization. We had only one at that time that was able to detect left and right at 18 megahertz, but we had to add uh, TPs uh, to get a wide range of things there. Uh, the other station was at Owens Valley Observatory, the Caltech Observatory, and that had to be a completely different station set up there. And the other one was the Maipu Radio Observatory. Uh, I began working there before I came to Korea. And we had to actually come up with different instrumentation and different things uh, uh, to the observatory. So I had to make a trip actually there. Some other people who contributed to that was uh, uh, Dr. Bill Erickson. Some of you know he built um, a thousand or two thousand TPs in Clark Lake in California. Uh, he was at that time a uh, University of Maryland faculty member. So he was uh, in Tasmania, observing uh, from there. Uh, Dr. Koitiro Maeda from Japan and Miguel Prestage from Australia using the Kruger uh, Observatory. On top of that, uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Kellogg from the University of Minnesota. He set up on a station in South Africa also, and so he uh, sent us part of the data. We exchanged data uh, with him. Here is part of the group uh, from the uh, uh, University of Florida. Uh, it was taken from one of the publications here. You can see a few people uh, there. Chuck Higgins uh, here, Leonard Garcia, Wes Greenman, uh, which was in part in charge of many things. Uh, uh, Tony Felix, he's the uh, creator and maintainer of the spaceweather.com. Many of you might be familiar with that. Uh, people from Chile, uh, some others from uh, Japan, and things like that. Here you have the same. Uh, Tony Felix and Wes Greenman were in charge of actually Tony and uh, 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 Wes were in charge of buying antennas equipment shipped everything to California, set up the whole station there uh, that included two rock periodics and one 18 polarimetric antenna or so. So that was a big thing because everybody had to rush and, and do the things there. Uh, I was in charge of going to Chile and write the software there. I had two weeks to write the software and be able to uh, uh, manage the AD converter and all the interfaces there. Uh, we have 
to um, mention uh, Jorge Levy and I and I work in our group. He passed away about 10 years ago or six years ago. Uh, he contributed part of the equipment and building the antenna. And Jim Deweiser, he's a, a scientist with the SOFIA uh, space lab. That's the infrared telescope mounted on the uh, 747, the model <coughs> 747. He's doing a nice job there. He was an undergraduate at that time, uh, a very interesting topic uh, for him. All right. So here is the distribution of uh, the uh, uh, station. So let's go back here. Uh, so here we have uh, our observatory in Florida, the one in Owens Valley, the one in Maipu, and the other one in South Africa, uh, Hope Yellow. Uh, Dr. Erickson here in Tasmania, uh, Leo Prestige there in Australia, and uh, Koitiro Maeda there in Japan. Those were the center we, we were able to get information from there. All right. uh, here are some of the frequencies that we used to observe uh, from different uh, points. So, uh, using the uh, uh, radio Observatory in Florida, Maipu in Chile, and Owens Valley, we were able to score all these frequencies there. From Bruni Island, he set up a huge uh, um, uh, antenna there. It's a uh, log periodic antenna that's high in a, in a pole and has all the rest of the things there. So he said he was able to observe between 5 and 36 megahertz. He built that antenna to observe the sun at the lowest frequency at that time. Uh, from Japan, those were the frequencies that they were able to observe. They have a group of TP, I think they have about four TPs uh, to observe the emission. And from Kulgara, we have uh, the spectrograph that covers uh, 15 to uh, 57 megahertz or so. These are some of the fragments that were able to be observed from the different stations. So from our station, we were able to observe the combination of all of them, about 12 of the 23 fragments. Uh, Maeda from Japan, six, and Ericsson, about seven or so. So a combination of 19 of the <coughs> fragments. That's all that we could do. Uh, here is some of the statistics about the observations. So this is... Uh, the, uh, the activity that we detected during uh, part of the, the year there, here is part of the observation of times, uh, the, how many hours of observation, how many hours of activity we detected beginning June until September. Some of the stations didn't continue after <coughs> uh, we have the collision, but a few continue observing, so we have some sporadic uh, things that we were able to detect there. All right, here is uh, more of the same. So we have the <coughs> CML high phase to see how much we core that uh, within the week of the collision, the courage within the week of the collision. The letters uh, that you see here are the different impacts that uh, were observed in the CML high phase. And uh, here is part of the things for the months before the collision, how much time we were observer, observing and how many hours we were able to observe. And okay, um, part of the, the thing, we, we have our eyes very open to anything there. And so everybody was looking at the chart recorder, the computers and everything there, but uh, we concentrated more on, on this thing, uh, searching for pulses of emission close either before or after uh, the collision time of the fragment uh, for continuous emission uh, from Jupiter using the big array that's a 640 dipole array, of course, about 30,000 square meters. And also for any simultaneous pulses from the different stations, uh, which uh, will probably guarantee that uh, the emission received there wasn't interfering with anything else. So here is uh, one of them. Uh, so looking for something that happened close to the collision, uh, I really skip some of the same. We, every day we went through the records and tried to find anything there. 
One of the things that we found was near the collision of fragment Q1 and Q2. Uh, uh, these two things we got in there, we have a lot of interference of that day, so we have to clean the data. Uh, but here is part of the information. So we were able to detect something there pretty close to the collision of the comet. The comet uh, collided around, uh, well, the, the emission 1950 or so, pretty close to the collision of the comet, and this one there. I think I have uh, somewhere else the time of the collision. That was uh, left hand polarized. This one is right hand polarized, so the, the burst that we see there was at several frequencies there. Here is the frequency. Uh, the second one was right hand polarized, but we didn't have information about 32 megahertz uh, here. So, um, so here is a listing of some of the things. Uh, here we have the frequency at which we detected the two pulses, which we call A and B. Uh, that's the um, flux density of each one of the pulses. And the duration of the pulses, uh, left hand polarized for the first one, right hand polarized for the other one. And here is the axial ratio for each one of them. Uh, right hand, left hand and right hand here. Uh, the axial, uh, axial ratio is defined there. Like I said, there was no information. We didn't have any antenna or any receiver for 32 megahertz right hand, so we didn't have that information. So, um, I began searching. After I got the, uh, this mission, I began searching for anything in particular regarding this uh, expert. And so here is a plot that I got from Paul uh, Shaw uh, from JPL, in which it shows the trajectory of the fragment uh, near the Q uh, fragment. And here is the IO flux field uh, that connects IO with the, the magnetic field. And wow, I thought that there might be something interesting there. So I went a little bit before that and began plotting here uh, distance and longitude and distance and latitude. And there is a coincidence there for the flux still a few degrees. I think it's about five degrees uh, from the uh, instantaneous flux still. There is a coincidence there. There is much to uh, change there, but there is a coincidence there. So it appears like the fragment went through the IO flux still located about five degrees from the instantaneous flux still. And we thought that that may, may be well. Uh, Paul Keller was observing uh, at the same time from the uh, uh, University of Minnesota. And he didn't observe anything there. No one of the other stations were able to receive anything. Uh, this one happened during the daytime. Uh, it was a lot of lighting. And the planet was uh, within the, the field. Uh, the sun was a little bit farther to the west, but the attenuation may have been around 15 to 20 dB or so for the antenna. So we were pretty, pretty confident that we detected something there. But like I said, you can see here, uh, Paul Kielo was observing here, and here is the impact of <coughs> Q1 and Q2 here. And he didn't detect anything from, from there. At that time, the sun has set in South Africa, so he couldn't detect, uh, very unlikely that he would detect any solar burst. So his uh, suggestion, and he published that in the paper that he published, is that probably what we detected was a faint uh, solar burst, probably attenuated by uh, the antenna, but he didn't detect anything. So that was pretty much part of the story. I presented this thing to a meeting in a grass in Austria, uh, just in case, but we actually never published vision on that because of, I think it was clear that it may have been a solar burst. Here is another observation. This is a group of um, radio amateurs that set up an antenna and they detected that one. Uh, they published a short article there in Sky and Telescope. And here is our records of the same frequency, uh, 22.2 megahertz uh, at the same time. That's pretty much the same time there. We didn't detect anything around there either. All right. Here's another uh, 
This one was, uh, this uh, detection of this pulse was uh, detected at Owens Valley by uh, our station there at 18 megahertz. And uh, this is what we detected here. Uh, so we didn't detect anything. There was no coincidence. We have to be aware that Jupiter's emission, as you can see, sometimes you can detect the emission in one place, not in the other because of the ionosphere. But uh, that was one of the things. Uh, if we were going to claim any detection, we have to have something more than uh, detection at one place. And so it didn't qualify according to our standards there. Uh, in that, uh, our case, we were using, trying to observe from when the planet arrives until it's set there, using Yagi antennas at the beginning, switching to the TTs, and then continue with the Yagi, so we didn't try to miss anything there. Here is another, another interesting thing. This is uh, detected at Kulgoran fragment C. Uh, fra the collision of fragment C happened at uh, 0, 7, 12 universal time, a little bit before that. And here you can see two first uh, probably type of N event drifting there. Uh, but that was part of uh, uh, an IOB pre prediction. So we knew that we, we get something there. So we, we couldn't tell that that's triggered by, by the comet either. Here is another one. Um, this one, Kulgoran, uh, they detected something here. And uh, almost at the same time, um, Dr. Bill Erickson detected something there. But there is a chip there, I think I mentioned about two minutes there between one and the other. Uh, we weren't, they were not sure. I tried to ask them, and they could not confirm if their timing was correct there. It could have been cheaper there, but the fact is that there wasn't a, a, a coincidence according to the, what we, we had there. All right. Uh, trying to detect uh, continuous emission from uh, there. So we... <coughs> Uh, use the big array, uh, which uh, is not operational anymore. So, you know, some of you know part of the story. Uh, they have removed, they, they broke each one of the dipoles and they stole them and sell them for uh, aluminum. They cut the lines and all, all the antennas that we have, they cut all the lines, sold them for copper for a few cents. Uh, so we cannot operate any, any more antenna there. But here are some of the fragments that we were able to observe with the big array. Like I said, the, the big array has an uh, effective area of about 20,000 square meters or so, trying to detect continuous emission from, from there. <coughs> uh, the only thing that we were able to detect was uh, uh, Jupiter's emission on uh, this, close to these two fragments, but that's pretty much a predicted emission there, nothing for the other ones. Okay, here is a, an example with the big array. Uh, just to make sure that we actually have the big array pointing in the right direction, uh, after we finish with the observations, uh, we uh, point to the array just uh, a couple of degrees from where it was before, and we were able to observe one of the radio sources, Hydra A. And that is what you see there. That's in the middle of the day, around noon or so, with a lot of lightning. Uh, you can see the, the um, part of the, the drift scan of the, the, uh, the Hydra A. This is just uh, for uh, July 16, the same beam. Uh, this already has four beams to the east, uh, four beams to the west or so. So, uh, we didn't detect anything there, so let me go to the next one. Here, another one, the same source is here, and here we have uh, the uh, effect of the Jupiter emission, but that's a predicted emission also. All right, here is uh, uh, a diagram uh, published by uh, Dr. Oya from Tsukuku University, in which he seems to have detected something there. Uh, so he plotted CML and uh, three different frequencies, and he claimed that there was some kind of emission around here, 
and some are around here also. Uh, like I said, here is what we got there. So I plotted that one in CML for all the observations begin uh, Ju July 16, 17, 18, 19. And this is the uh, lightning crashes here. Uh, this is calibration here, the same thing here. We didn't detect anything and any of the CML uh, where he claimed to have detected something there. Here is another one for one of the last day, uh, July 20th. Uh, Q1 and Q2, here we have to search around here to find and clean and come up with the reflection for these uh, uh, two events. Okay. Uh, we went a little bit farther and we computed the occurrence probability there for the whole year from January until the end. This is for the source IOA, IOB, IOA, IOC, and this is what we got there. So we didn't detect any increase in the occurrence probability for the week of the collision either. So that's another thing. So uh, here is a, a Final, finally, this thing. These are some of the papers published by different people. Two from us, uh, another one from uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Dr. Paul Kielo from the University of Minnesota published that. All of them that, uh, reporting no emission from the collision of the, the comet. And uh, these two things here, uh, what you saw before, uh, detected this emission in two different CML locations, and they also seem to have detected something and they published that in this paper. I have copies of the papers. Uh, I can send them to you. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I'm going to, uh, if I can do that without uh, the copyright or not, but uh, if you're interested to read some of the papers, we can do that. This uh, group here was observing using the Ulysses spacecraft, which has a frequency below one megahertz. They didn't detect anything either. And we met there um, in grass uh, probably about three months after the collision. So I got a chance to talk to them also. And to Philippe Sarkar from Nancy and Keith said that they didn't detect anything with their antenna also. So I think that's pretty much uh, and the thing. So the observations made by our group or all the other stations that provided some kind of uh, emission, we can conclude that we didn't detect any, any emission from the collision of the comet. Uh, several other people seem to have detected something, but we cannot confirm any, any of those things. All right, I think that's finished with my 